this webinar today is presented by InfoPro Learning. We appreciate everybody joining. Um, a little bit about our organization for those that have not heard of InfoPro Learning before. We're a full service learning and development organization. We've been around for just over 25 years or so, and our real focus is on delivering engaging learning experiences. And we are a global organization. I see people coming in from all countries and all continents here. Um, so uh, we can support all of you, I guess I would say. Some of the core focus areas for us you can see on the screen here. Um, today, one of the, the things that we're really gonna talk about is centered around uh, learning content um, and kind of in training delivery as well. Uh, uh, we decided to host this webinar um, in response to to a lot of our clients coming back to us and saying, uh, you know, we really need to push this initiative of of converting our instructor-led classes over to blended training. Um, and so with that, um, we're hoping that this is a very informative session for you. Uh, for any of those of you that are not familiar with GoToWebinar, that's a platform we use for webinars, there is not a chat functionality available between, there is a Q&A. Um, please ask any questions that you have using the questions tab. And if you have, uh, we'll do our best to answer them um, throughout and then uh, a larger session at the end will be designated to that Q&A session. One of the most common questions that we get, is there going to be a recording handed out? Absolutely. Uh, we do our best to have this uploaded within 48 hours. Um, we'll upload it on the website. We'll send you an email with a link where you can access that as well. Um, so you will have a recording um, made available to you. So feel free to just engage um, and then have uh, the recording for later if you want to take detailed notes. Joining me on the call today, we have Anu Gahotra. Anu, can we flip to, there you are, uh, Vice President of Learning Solutions with InfoPro Learning. Anu has been in this space for over 18 years now, um, and she works with various clients from lots of different industries at, uh, on really how to solve their problems, not just their learning problems, but their business problems as well. And, and at InfoPro as well, she helps set up our learning strategy. And a lot of this is focused around content strategies, uh, ranging from uh, you know, one of the most popular questions, should this be e-learning, should this be mobile learning, should this be ILT, and how long should this training session be? Um, from those simple questions to much more complex, uh, Anu is really our rock star and, and leads the way to answering some of those. Thank you so much for joining us today, Anu. Thank you, Nolan. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining in. Um, we are looking forward to this uh, session. Um, as we start, uh, thank you for the lovely introduction, uh, Nolan. Uh, I don't think I need to say anything more about my experience. Um, starting uh, the session today, uh, there are quite a few things that we're going to cover. Uh, we will start with talking about the benefits of blended learning, you know, why go blended, um, and uh, what kind of options are available in blended learning. We will also look at, uh, you know, uh, how to determine the right blend of uh, different modalities for the learning assets that you have in the program. And then uh, from there on, we will talk about, um, in fact, a large section of this uh, webinar today will be focused on uh, specific tips that can help you create a good, um, you know, performance-centric blended learning program. So without further ado, uh, let's start talking about blended learning. Why blended learning? You know, uh, we did uh, um, another webinar a few days, a few weeks ago, where we were looking at, uh, you know, um, some tips to go uh, go forward from a face-to-face -face training to a virtual training. And in that webinar, we specifically focused on um, um, you know, going from face-to-face uh, -face programs to uh, virtual programs, they could be, uh, you know, uh, specifically um, uh, the VILT programs that, that are still synchronous. Um, but essentially, uh, you know, and we talked a lot about um, the benefits of going virtual and how it can help you give, uh, uh, you know, get a better scale, uh, have a wider reach for the program. Uh, and now we're taking, taking the conversation one step forward when we're saying, um, you know, when we have to go virtual, why limit yourself to um, a VILT experience? Why not consider the blend of different options? You know, and when we talk about blended learning, there are a range of different options open up in terms of, uh, you know, achieving um, uh, the benefits like having a very, very superior learning experience because then we look at uh, you know um, uh, different options that exist in terms of creating blended learning 
um, they definitely lend themselves better to uh, the different learning styles, um, you know, the different topics, subject areas and uh, just giving a more uh, comprehensive, more, uh, uh, you know, um, scalable experience to learners. So learning experience is definitely a clear advantage here. And then uh, it also helps reduce the overall training time and the, um, you know, the expenditure associated with um, um, the travel uh, that is needed for in-person sessions. Uh, it also helps optimize the training time uh, because, uh, you know, as a general rule, uh, anything that's self-paced takes um, um, a significantly less uh, seat time as compared to a face-to-face -face experience. And we'll talk more about that as we, uh, you know, uh, look at, uh, as we go ahead in this uh, webinar. Um, we also uh, see a very clear benefit in terms of, um, uh, you know, having a wider scalability, wider reach for the program. Uh, primarily because, uh, you know, face-to-face -face programs are more uh, uh, restrictive. Uh, you can only have limited number of participants as against a digital program that can uh, reach, um, you know, thousands of more learners. So surely uh, a very, very, very beneficial proposition. Um, and just so that you know, in our experience, what we've also seen is uh, while the initial investment associated with the blended learning program is higher, a face-to-face -face program is easier to put together, quicker to put together, um, you know, uh, but over a period of time, as uh, you reach, you know, a wider audience, uh, um, larger number of participants, a blended learning program actually leads to a better uh, return on investment, you know, while all the investment is upfront. Uh, there's practically, um, you know, very less minimal cost associated with uh, maintaining that program over a period of time and also uh, running it with, uh, you know, as many learners as, as you want. There is no travel involved, there is no instructor time, uh, or there is limited instructor time. So moving forward uh, with these benefits in mind, uh, uh, you know, let's look at... Uh, how can we effectively go from INT, a classroom experience, to a blended training experience? So um, what you see on my slide are essentially, um, you know, two learning journeys that we've compared. Uh, the first one being uh, a virtual, um, uh, you know, uh, I would say a synchronous experience, which could be virtual or it could be face-to-face, -face, but it is still a journey. You know, uh, it is still not a single training event, um, as against doing a more blended experience, which has multiple different modalities. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, what, what I have up on my screen has videos, it has, uh, you know, simulations, it has virtual IELT sessions, it also has uh, some self paced training, some online cohort interactions, right? So still, uh, you know, um, uh, both the approaches have, uh, uh, do not, are not looking at training as one single experience. They are both learning journeys, but the range of modalities is very different, right? So, um, you know, a blended experience um, incorporating many more elements is what I have here. And both of them have different benefits, you know, with respect to both these approaches lend themselves to different kinds of benefits while, uh, you know, and we talked about some of those in our uh, previous webinar, but while a virtual experience uh, or a face-to-face -face experience is easy to put together in terms of, you know, the upfront, upfront content development time, um, a blended experience takes much more thought. It takes uh, careful planning, you know, and uh, uh, a lot of investment upfront. So when you go from an IELT to blended learning experience, it is very, very important, you know, because many of these classroom experiences that we end up redesigning are, um, you know, are uh, were created a few years ago, you know, uh, some of them being as old as, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and some of them being more recent, but still, you know, technology has come a long way in the last four or five years. So it is very, very important that we revisit the business goals associated with the program. Uh, while you are looking at, you know, uh, modernizing the program from the overall format perspective, the delivery perspective, uh, it gives us good opportunity to look at the purpose of that program, you know, uh, look at the goals of that program, validate those goals with the business stakeholders. Uh, because, like I said, it's, uh, it's, it's a significant effort to, um, to, you know, make it blended. And that there is, you know, having a very, very deep, deep view of the current state, having a very deep view of where we want to reach really helps us, um, 
you know design uh, the blend well so that's one thing that you must must do and then um, uh, while we do this exercise it is also important to think about learners you know what is it that they are looking for from the program it is important to given a choice you know just run a run a few surveys with, with your end learners you know see what is working for them in the current classroom training program what are the best practices that you can carry forward versus what is it that you should absolutely change you know and when you're doing that you know think about content uh, is it is it all updated does it need a change for the current business context um because you know anyway when you're going to redesign uh, the content can also be relooked from uh, uh, the the current applicability perspective and then format and modality design is anyway a part of the process um i would also re recommend that you know you look at the technology available to uh, to deliver the program uh, depending on the technology there are lot of different features that you can use there are lot of different uh, uh, modalities that you can use uh, design for the infrastructure that you have available so with that thought um, <clears throat> you know i have another slide here which i think is really really important in the current context and this is essentially about how people learn today right uh, this is a research from bersin um, uh, by deloitte very very credible one uh, essentially what it uh, you know what it tells us is that uh, people today are overwhelmed you know they are distracted they are impatient they do not go through long chunks of content um you know the typical time that they have available for training in any particular week is not more than uh, you know 20 odd minutes and there's a lot of information available you know there is internet uh, people can pull out any information that they want you know they can get access to a lot more than what was available in the past so which makes um, you know a learning designer's job a little more complicated because now um while uh, you know it is important to um to design a learning asset that can really drive the learning along it is also important to capture the um uh, the, the attention of the learners you know uh, which uh, you know there there are a lot of different options available but selecting the right option is very very important for capturing uh, learner attention and while we're talking about modern learners here uh, modern does not necessarily mean young generation you know so i, I you know uh, in our experience it's seen almost everyone who's uh, into the corporate world today is uh, you know has access to a lot of information and therefore a large population falls in this you know in this particular category you know, the the funny thing so is that I would like this to represent on this slide is if you're wondering um you know is that true or not i think 9 out of the 10 people we show this to the only thing that they actually take away is the middle section which is probably 1% <laughs> of the content so <laughs> it kind of holds true um within the single slide as well right right absolutely good point nolan so with that thought uh, you know uh, it's important to stay focused on learners it's important to um, you know capture their attention and uh, with that in mind uh, you know uh, i have a few tips to share with you uh, in this particular webinar um so uh, you know the first and foremost most important one being uh, you know start with the end in mind you know what is it that we're looking to achieve in the program define your end goals um as as very very measurable outcomes the more measurable they are uh, the easier it is to you know stay focused on those goals as you make decisions about uh, you know about the content about delivery methods um about chunking that content and uh, you know um also finding the right uh, Uh, spacing for those learning assets you know uh, should you deliver it all in one week should you you know um, choose to deliver it over four weeks all of those deci decisions become very very easy once we uh, define what is it that we're looking to achieve so the um, you know defining goals is important um, as you've seen here you know what we typically like to do is uh, you know as as a company the couple of grand promises that we make to our clients uh, when we work on these kind of learning programs um and those grand promises are 
primarily focused around a meaningful learning experience and measurable performance transformation. So keeping those in mind, uh, basically what we like to focus on is the, um, are the four different levels of the Kirkpatrick model, you know, just thinking about the learning experience with respect to uh, the learner engagement as well as the learning that they derive from those assets but also at the higher levels uh, you know trying to see how is it that we can make the behavior change happen and how is it that you know um, we can um, uh, cater to the stakeholder expectations or uh, calculate the return on investment on the program so if you define your me your measurement and evaluation plan right in the beginning it gives us a very very good focus on uh, uh, you know on finding the right ways to uh, make those outcomes happen so therefore, you know, first and foremost, define the measurement plan, define the goals, and then move forward. Your goals could look like, okay, it's a, you know, we've implemented a new system in the organization, and therefore look, we're looking at, uh, uh, you know, um, a greater adoption to that system, or it could be, um, you know, more, um, um, it could be a softer goal, you know, which uh, which may not be measurable, but when you break down the measurement plan you will be able to figure out, uh, you know, specific ways to make uh, measurement happen. So start with outcomes. Start with, uh, you know, defining those outcomes. Uh, make them as measurable as possible. So that's the first tip. And then uh, as we move forward, um, another important thing to think about is the constraints. You know, what constraints are you operating in? Uh, do you have uh, Do you have a budget defined for the program? You know. Given uh, anything that is available to you, you know there is no um, there's no limit to the kind of things that you can use. You know, do you can make it very very fancy. You know, right from using videos to 3D to um, AR, VR. You know, there is no limit to the technology um, that is available. But if you have a budget, uh, then you have to play within that budget. So it is important to you know. Um, define that budget upfront so that you know you can spend uh, money on things that are important. So cost optimization is the key here, uh, and it is very very possible to drive the same business goals through you know by using uh, different kind of assets that may be simpler in nature. Uh, it's just about you know um, defining uh, those uh, um, those constraints upfront and working backwards from there. And then similarly, is there a timeline that you're trying to meet? You know, can you take six months to develop this program versus one year, you know, uh, or versus two years that you have available to kind of uh, do anything that you like? Uh, businesses are dynamic. They're complex. Uh, these days, things are changing very frequently. Everybody's looking for quick results. So it is, uh, it is important that whatever you do, uh, you know, you stay, um, you stay, uh, focused on the business needs and uh, you know make the process very agile so um, in the last webinar that we did we, we talked about how we could phase out the um, development going from uh, an in-person program to a virtual program and then going to a blended learning program you know and even even if you want to go directly from um, uh, a face-to-face -face to a blended learning program or from virtual to a blended learning program you know, there are a lot of things that you can phase out, uh, focusing on the critical components of that program and then adding, um, you know, more fancy features as you go by. So think about the timeline. And similarly, uh, looking at the infrastructure that you have available to you is very, very important. Uh, do you have a learning management system available? If not, um, how are you going to deploy the program? Is it going to be a knowledge management system? Uh, can you do, you know, uh, can you make some quick wins happen through um, maybe, you know, just launching a few things on the intranet, you know, or uh, starting a community of practice on the intranet. So, you know, a bunch of different options basically um, define, uh, you know, the constraints that you have. And like I said earlier, regardless of what you have available or not have available, there is always a way to measure the, uh, to deliver on the outcomes. So therefore important to define the constraints up front. Once you define um, the constraints and then, uh, you know, get down to creating a framework, another thing that's important uh, to think about is 
you know the the whole element of accountability which is very very high in in person programs and also high in um, uh, virtual synchronous programs you know where there is an instructor available um uh, working with the uh, participants uh, you know um, keeping them focused on specific uh, aspects of the program here uh, especially when you go self paced you know when your some of your modalities are going to be self paced they're going to be uh, uh, you know available for learners to take at their uh, own leisure um sometimes it becomes very very you know difficult to um to have learners you know uh, focused on uh, completing the program uh, especially in some cases when you know um, as an example you know if there is a high focus on results everything is time bound you want learners to complete the programs in a in a certain uh, time period uh, there may be value in creating additional accountability by still incorporating some elements of instructor mentorship support uh, in your uh, blended program it could be minimal support you know uh, for example you may have a, a live program kick off you know um, at the beginning you may have some qa q and a or uh, some debrief sessions uh, every week you know depending on the length of the program or you may have those sessions at critical points in the program but uh, but just having uh, you know an instructor or mentor available to do frequent check ins with the um, uh, with the learner population or just uh, you know meet them solve for the challenges that they have uh, you know um, take their questions it helps drive uh, completion on the program so think about it um, you know um, it may be needed in some cases versus the others but um, it does have uh, a lot of value and there can be uh, still a very scalable way to make it happen another tip as we move forward uh, and uh, uh, pretty much where nolan brings a lot of value is the pre marketing piece um, learner adoption like any system adoption is very very important you know you invest hugely into a program to make it blended um, and uh, you know just creating a program and putting on lms may not really get you the results it's important to uh, drive communication around that program make people aware that there's something coming up generate excitement um, you know answer what is in it for them uh, which uh, which can build a lot of traction so you can use things like videos uh, email campaigns um, infographics anything that helps uh, build excitement um, you know um, drive learners to the to the program so this for example here is um, you know um, an emailer that uh, nolan and team created for this particular webinar and the reason why all of you are here so so it is uh, you know an important activity to do, do. yeah and, and, nolan, and, uh, thanks anu and, and what i usually um advise on this is is it's really hard to secure budgets for training programs that is a given uh, i absolutely understand that one of the things that I try to educate a lot of our clients on is how an uh, increasing your spend, even if it's an internal resources time, will actually help you maximize the ROI. Uh, a very you know easy example is is this you know uh, this webinar. Um, this webinar uh, to, to host to to have the platform that allows for these people um, to. Uh, uh, have a news time, the people that created the PowerPoint, there's a cost associated to all of this. However, if I'm able to get more people to attend this webinar, I can say, hey, you know, maybe I spent you know, $2,000 making this webinar, but I was able to get 500 people. That sounds a lot better than if I spent $2,000 getting 100 people. So a lot of times when you make an extra expense into your learning program, it absolutely is an expense. But if you can get more people to consume your content, um, that really decreases your cost. Um, you know, I, I hosted a session on this at, at ATD a bit ago about measuring your true cost per learner. And uh, it was really eye-opening for a lot of attendees who said, you know, I never really thought to measure a cost per learner as cost of engagement. I was just saying, you know, hey, if I spent $10,000, on a program and I sent it to 100 people, my cost per learner was $10. I didn't stop to think, if I only got 50 people to show up, 
my true cost per learner was twenty dollars. So that's that's how you can, uh, you know, use marketing and spend in marketing and get more budgets to do a little bit of marketing to show that impact. Thanks, Anu. Absolutely, you know, that was a good point you made. Very important to measure what we do. So, uh, so moving forward, um, another important thing uh, uh, you know to mention here, and again, this is the crux of the blended program that we built, is think about the program like a campaign, you know, like a journey, instead of um, you know just hosting it as a single learning event. Um, the moment we think about it as a journey, because learning does not happen in one day. You know, you may want, you may do um, a classroom program around a very, very important topic. You know, or maybe do a two or three day workshop. Um, but essentially, there are statistics available around how uh, people forget 85, 86 percent of what they learn in a classroom right after going to their workplaces, right? And probably another few percentage points over a period of time, and then you know, over a period of time that even just remains a memory. Unless unless we keep it fresh in learners' mind, um, you know, it is, um, it, it's hard to kind of, uh, you know, drive focus, drive performance through the program. Um, what I have here as an example is, is a journey that, you know, um, uh, that is crafted for uh, a program that was envisioned to be a two-day workshop where starting from program communication to to building pre-work around it to building engagement around it um you know and then even after the workshop uh driving results by uh you know just continuing uh, that effort and continuing the thought process through coaching sessions through um you know a very defined measurement over 30 60 90 days um, to doing weekly practice activities, and they may not really take a lot of time from the learner. You know, it may just be a, a 10 minute activity that the learner does in a particular week related to that subject area. You know, somebody prompting, thinking about, you know, that subject and saying, okay, let's do a case study together. You know, some of those activities could be, um, could be more, uh, you know, guided by uh, instructors, mentors, uh, managers. While some of those could be completely self-paced, you know, just sending out a reading material um, once in a week could be just a small article, or maybe using communities of practice. You know, everybody has uh, the basic um, uh, technology platforms available. You know, if not anything, you can even use social media for that. You know, just create a good community, uh, have uh, uh, a good moderator, you know, who can uh, guide discussions. And then just start one, one discussion a week, you know, have people participate, share resources, share articles, share curated content, you know, get some engagement going. So a lot of those things can be done to kind of, uh, you know, continually stay on the point with respect to the performance goals. And, uh, and uh, you know, you will suddenly see um, great results. For the program because um, while a learning uh, event or any training program is what learners do anyway uh, it is the engagement over a period of time that builds thought leadership that builds performance you know uh, that actually brings learning back to their jobs you know there's much more contextualization as as you uh, read through various different case studies and you know um, different context use cases for that information Another thing that is important in thinking about the journey is that regardless of who the program is for, there is, uh, you know, there are managers working with these learners. Uh, they do have their immediate line of leaders working with them. So how can we leverage them to, um, to you know, really add to the learning experience is another uh, thing that uh, to think about, you know, how can we prepare managers up front to support their, um, uh, you know, teams through the learning process. Um, what we like to do is, in many different cases, you know, we do a quick session with the managers, building expectations about the program, talking about the performance goals, you know, uh, giving them tips and tricks on how uh, they can um, support learners through the process, or or build a guided journey around it. You know, the options are tremendous. It all depends on, you know, what you're trying to solve for. A uh, lot of different, uh, um, um, there are a lot of different ways in which you can approach this. But basically, the idea is to think about learning as a campaign rather than thinking about it as a single event and just using what is available to make uh, the journey happen. So moving forward, 
um, uh, another important thing is, uh, like I said, you know, uh, some of you, when you begin to redesign programs, you may have constraints associated with the budget, associated with the timeline, which may really, um, you know, pose a big uh, um, question in your mind about uh, the effectiveness. Uh, like I said earlier, the, um, you know, effectiveness is, you can always find a way regardless of uh, the budget and timelines that you have available. There are always some quick wins in the process. Um, you know, find those quick wins. Not everything has to be fancy. You know, uh, there is no guarantee that even if you create everything as uh, a VR solution or as a, um, you know, a 3D solution, it will uh, yield better results. Or even if you do like fancy videos, you know, they will yield better results. Uh, look for quick wins. There, there, there is a lot available these days. You can do DIY videos, you know, DIY uh, tools to create videos. You can use rapid authoring tools to create content. You can even, uh, you know, use your experts, your subject matter experts available in the organization to kind of, you know, record quick videos using even iPhones you know, your regular phones and uh, uh, do some quick editing to uh, publish great content. Uh, especially when we're talking about building post support, um, you know, all of these videos uh, come really handy, you know, just doing um, a, a video blog versus, you know, writing long text to kind of make a point. It, doing a video may be easier in many different cases and it helps build engagement. So think about, uh, you know, the options that are quickly available. Um, besides, you don't have to create all the content, right? A lot is available um, online. A lot is available, um, you know, in various different uh, resources. You may want to curate a lot of content rather than create everything from scratch. And that helps you, um, you know, save timeline, uh, save on the overall timelines associated with the program. It can also help you, um, uh, you know, uh, save some development cost. So uh, you can use TED Talk, um, any resources that are freely, freely available to kind of, you know, generate discussions, um, you know, just continue the learning as, and, as you go by. And Anu, a question that we usually get, and I know that, that, that you have experience with a lot of them, so I felt it might be helpful uh, to have your perspective. What are some of the rapid authoring tools, you know, maybe can you just start with, you know, a definition of, uh, of some of the rapid author, uh, of why you use a rapid authoring tool, and then some examples of the tools that you like? Sure, great question, uh, Nolan. So, um, so rapid authoring tool, various different tools are available in the market, very easy to use, easy to um, publish. There are things like, um, you know, Lectora, there is Storyline, there is, um, you know, even um, even the basic PowerPoint can be very quickly published using Articulate uh, suite of products. You know, um, all you have to do is, uh, you know, use your PowerPoint as the input, build animations into the PowerPoint and then publish it using the tool to kind of add voiceover and, you know, build some thinking. So, um, so yeah, there is Articulate set, um, you know, Storyline being a little more fancy than the, than the basic um, uh, Articulate Studio um, tools that are available. And then there's Lectora, there's Captivate, that helps you build very, very quick um, videos, you know, um, system simulations, for example, any demos that you have to create are very simple, very easy to build in uh, Captivate. There's another tool called Camtasia that you can use to record the um, system demos. So, so bunch yeah, of so, different options in fact. Yeah. So, so in short, then, uh, you know, to summarize, a rapid authoring tool is a way that helps you quickly create e-learning assets. And a lot of these things that Tanu mentioned, um, one of the key components of these great, great tools is that they produce into a SCORM file. So it allows you to take content that, that maybe you don't even know how to spell SCORM. You, you don't know. You've never heard SCORM is before, but you want to create e-learning. These allow you to take, you know, in some cases, a simple PowerPoint deck, upload it to the tool, and convert it to a SCORM file that allows somebody to take it online and to track all of that training. And so really a rapid authoring tool is just a, a tool that helps you quickly create content, whether that's, you know, video, e-learning, whatever it is, in, in a quicker manner. Thanks, right. Yeah. And at the same time, thank you, Nolan, for that. 
at the same time you know you can use the same tool and uh, really go fancy you know um, so for example your phase one could be a quick conversion your phase two could be okay now let me add some fancy media elements to it let me add some you know uh, videos to this content um, let me add some uh, uh, you know uh, professional voiceover to this content and you know get it to the level of maturity that you need uh, all of it does not have to be like you know, the first phase, you can do it um, over various different stages. But many of these tools are also Storyline, for example. While you can build a course quickly in Storyline, you can also uh, build a very fancy product with Storyline. You can even go to the extent of, you know, customizing the graphical user interface, uh, you know, the play bar, the buttons, and really make it look like a product that is uh, that is professionally created and not rapidly put together using a rapid authoring tool. So you may really want to phase it out, but there are various different, uh, um, you know, options available. So, in fact, uh, another uh, thing to think about is also if your learners are, um, you know, uh, are uh, looking for, um, or if your learners are constantly on the go and therefore just in time access, mobile access is very very important for you. To build into the program, many of these tools also allow for uh, um, you know um, completely responsive kind of a development. So, Lectora or Captivate, for example, they help you. Uh, you know, you can use the same media elements, the same content, and publish it into five different layouts, and that will take care of 80, 90 percent of the mobile devices that are available in the market. So, so a lot of options to explore here. Uh, Moving forward, um, and this uh, I believe is the last tip that I have here. Um, anything that you do, focus on the transfer of, of learning. You know, uh, what is it that the learners are taking back to their job is uh, is a very very important question to answer because, like I said earlier, 85, 86 percent of what learners um, go through in the classroom or in any formal learning program, they may forget most part of it by the time they go back to their jobs. So, uh, you know, how can we make their life easy when they're actually at their workplace and using the concepts that they learned in the training program? Um, what we like to do is any e-learning program that we create or any, um, uh, you know, classroom program that we create, regardless of the modality, anything that learners will need to remember when they go back to their workplaces, you know, um, just without a thought build a performance support around it you know give them infographic you know there's a process to remember give them an infographic that they can take back with them stick it on their workstations and you know use it in the moment of need um give it as a pdf you know they can just keep it handy on their workstation something that they can download and keep um you know any calculation that they have to do based on certain process steps Build a decision tool, you know, give them an Excel file that they can take with them, which could be comparatively easier to build. Or it could be something very fancy as well, right, depending on the uh, logic that you need. Um, but by default, anything that can help them, uh, you know, uh, help make their life simpler as they go back to their workstation, remember to, you know, uh, anything, any information that they need to remember, um, you know, list of documents that they need to remember, checklists. Um, just give them infographics, give them uh, quick information that they can download and, you know, take with them. Uh, you can also consider uh, things like electronic performance support system. If it is a, a system training that you're doing, for example, there are a lot of different tools available in the market that can help you um, build a layer on the top of the actual system uh, that helps them, uh, you know, helps the learners uh, quickly um, take a guide for the procedures that they're performing in the system. So, uh, you know, um, again, something that is just in time available at the point of need. Uh, it makes much more impact rather than, um, you know, going through a bunch of various different training programs. So, so a very, very, very important thing to think about. So that's, uh, we are at 2.40, um, you know, uh, I'm glad we are reaching, uh, you know, uh, the end of uh, this particular webinar. Uh, we are on time and we will have about 15 minutes to take your questions. Uh, a few things that we covered today, quickly before we, uh, you know, look at the questions that you have. Blended learning, um, 
the benefits. It helps drive superior learning experience, reduce training spend, increase speed to proficiency. Big benefits uh, really help drive the business goals. Um, and when you modernize your program, definitely, definitely revisit the business needs. Um, you know, they may have changed from uh, the time the program was built. So very important to think about, uh, you know, how, they, how the business needs uh, apply in today's context, what the current state looks like. Um, start from there and then define the measurable outcomes. Um, you know, define the, uh, the, the, the whole measurement and evaluation uh, plan for all different levels. Um, never lose sight of the, uh, the constraints that you have, uh, you know, outcomes and constraints are two good places to kind of start and, you know, um, start putting the framework in. So, um, so very, very important. And then uh, accountability, um, you know, think about uh, how you can provide support to the learners, how you can hold them accountable to everything uh, that they're doing in the program. Think of it like, you know, um, the training, um, the fitness training that you do, right? It is always uh, difficult to follow a plan without support uh, if you're not motivated enough. So, um, you know, look for opportunities to drive accountability. Um, and you can do it very, very easily through by running cohorts, by, you know, running batches uh, in a bunch of various different ways. Uh, another very important thing, pre-marketing communication, we spoke about the need for, uh, uh, you know, building good communication using videos, infographics, um, or just, you know, doing an email campaign even, uh, even before learners uh, start taking the program. Um, when you design your assets, uh, create a campaign, uh, you know, um, never, never, never think about training as a single event. Um, you always, you know, building pre-work, building post-work helps uh, drive performance gains. Um, based on your constraints, uh, look for quick wins, uh, DIY videos, um, you know, uh, rapid offering tools, all of those can help you quickly build some content. And then last but not the least, performance support uh, being very, very critical um, to the overall learning experience. Uh, as a thumb rule, anything, anything that the learners have to remember is what they should have handy to refer to. Um, these are the key points. Uh, over to you, Nolan. If you have any questions, we can take those up. Um, that's all that I had for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Thanks, Anu. Uh, appreciate uh, you taking us through this very helpful information. As Anu said, we have uh, resources available. You'll have the recording of this that will be available within 48 hours. We do our absolute best to do that. Um, on the right, you see, again, the services that our, our organization can help with. Um, some people have asked questions related to this. Um, if you have any questions uh, and want to speak with us, I'll go ahead and, and send um, uh, a note uh, to everybody with that information. Um, if you have any questions, please continue to use the tool, um, the, the Q&A tool, and we'll try to get through those. Um, to start one, there's one new that I, I think is very interesting. Uh, a gentleman, Michael Brown, um, had asked a question, with all the content available online, how do we manage copyright concerns and know what is available for public consumption or for a consultant to include? Um, now, when you're a consultant, I'll answer from the marketing side, because um, I, I have also faced this challenge um, as laws change, um, then you can maybe give a, a follow-up on that as well. Um, but the letter of the copyright law, the way it, it is at least, um, uh, you know, as a, what, what they give as a high-level practice, um, is that if you are not using it for commercial gain, then a lot of times, that is like the very first step you want to go through is if you're using it for commercial gain. So, you know, as a consultant, if you are selling this content out, then you have to be very careful. So you need to make sure when all of your searching, you're searching for okay for reuse. Um, and a lot of the search tools, YouTube, Google, um, things like that, they all have those options when you do search. If you search advanced search, then you're able to hear that. And 
I apologize if you hear the background. I'm I'm at my house. I guess the word's out, and my kids are are not very happy <laughs> about something that's happening. So I apologize for that. Probably wasn't. Uh, I didn't soundproof my room uh, enough. I guess. Um. But 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 yeah. So that's a really the, the number one thing that we always look at on the marketing side is if you're reusing it and selling it, um, you have to be extra careful. Um. But either way, uh, I know YouTube in particular and Google both have built into their search engines within their advanced settings you can search by type of content of course that limits your search options because not a lot of authors like to do that but that's usually a good first step Manu, do you want to add anything extra yeah. to that? very uh, yeah Nolan I think uh, you made a very good point uh, with respect to uh, you know how we can search for content that is uh, that is not uh, restricted by uh, copyright rules having said that there is also um, you know a, a, Unless you plan to kind of, uh, you know, lift and shift the content, um, there shouldn't be, uh, you know, so there are ways in which you can share uh, the same content without getting into copyright implications. For, for example, uh, sharing link versus copying the content and then, you know, building a learning asset around it are two entirely different things. So while you may not be able to lift and shift a lot of content that is uh, bound by copyright restrictions, you can share you you can still share links to those articles you know you can still share uh, links on the on the corporate intranet or in communities of practice you know build some good discussions around those uh, those links as well so important to be uh, mindful of the copyright uh, restrictions but there are uh, you know uh, there are ways to kind of still use that content um, curated content as a part of the learning plan which is more informal than formal learning. So, you know, stay away from copying and pasting content into the, into the e-learning courses. Great. And another question, we're definitely getting a lot of, uh, you know, interest in the tools that, that we use to help us. One thing in particular, you know, is asking about free or maybe, you know, uh, close to free tools. Um, you know, what, what have you seen um, out there new? What are some of the more low-cost tools um, that you like for for authoring. I know for me, um, I've always loved a picto chart from a good um, in, uh, infographic uh, job creation. Um, there's also a video creation tool, like a whiteboard video creation tool called Video Scribe. Um, they're both pretty reasonably priced, and, and for students, you know, or or small businesses, they may be even cheaper. So those are two good ones I know that I've used to create uh, tr uh, video content. Um, and then what are some other maybe you know free or, or lower cost for people to, to maybe test out before they go in and purchase a tool? Yeah, so most of these tools only have um, have trials available. Uh, if the idea is to test out, um, you know, some of these tools are. Uh, less expensive than the others but i would you know and some are completely free like you said the uh, picture chart or you know um or the video scribe tools um but most of the tools that are you know really established tools available in the market do have uh, some cost attached to them so the articulate suite of products or the or lectora or uh, even um articulate storyline for example all of those have uh, do have a licensing cost uh, there is an open framework available uh, called Adapt, you know, which you can customize program to your um, uh, benefit, and it is completely open source, but it needs programming support. So, so yeah, a bunch of various different options. I, um, you know, while some are free, but the established ones are not. Uh, they do have some cost associated to them. Thanks, Anu. Another question I'm getting is, how do you measure the engagement when you're going from something like instructor-led over to an e-learning session? How are you measuring, um, you know, that? <laughs> I guess we, uh, when you're shifting from one to the other platform, how do you know it's working? Great question. Absolutely a great question. So now um, I would say the answer is in the question itself. If we are comparing the two different modalities, how do you measure engagement in a, in an in-person session? You know, um, it is through through the participation that you're seeing in the program, right? It is through the survey that you're running at the end of the program, end of the day. Uh, it is through informal checks that the instructor is doing with the learners. Um, 
nothing stops us from doing those checks in a virtual classroom session or even um, you know even, even in a completely self paced uh, environment we have to think about creative ways to um, like i said you know build that accountability at what points do you do check ins with the learners at what points do you uh, just gather information through surveys uh, the various ways uh, you know if you think about it actively um, you know you can get creative with that to kind of you know um, to gather feedback uh, there are times when um, you know we have uh, we have bunch of various different assets in the same uh, in the same program you know 106 assets uh, to be done in like um seven eight weeks because it's all micro learning um uh, how we typically like to do is uh, you know at some places uh, we just pop a question on the lms saying you know give me a thumbs up thumbs down for this asset as against at you know end of every week i may want to run a survey as against um, you know at every uh, end of every module completion there may be an instructor kind of or a mentor reaching out to the participants for a more uh, anecdotal more descriptive feedback so so various different ways um, you know you can retain the components uh, feedback elements that you had in the classroom they just uh, deployed differently in a in a self paced program Wonderful, and 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 I think I'll um, you know I hate to shamelessly plug um, I guess our other stuff, but a lot of uh, you know we talk about that. For those that didn't see our other webinar, it came up a couple times in a couple of our other webinars we ran recently um, on the one converting uh, instructor led to virtual instructor led. So I'm just going to paste. Um, in the chat a link to that um, not only does that have a, a couple of our last webinars but it also has a lot of other information that's just uh, focused on um, remote workforce efficiency um, so please feel free to check out that content um, also this link is where we will post a recording for this webinar session as well um, so if you want to bookmark that um, again we'll send you an email with access to it but if you want to bookmark that tool you can as well um, I think uh, you know we. Uh, I think the majority of the questions at this point, Anu, have been asked. Um, can you flip over to the last slide, Anu, just so that we can share our contact details sure. there? Great. So, uh, as we said, we we hope to be uh, providing a ton of great content for you and, and help you along the journey of doing this conversion, whether it's your first time, you're just kind of being thrown into this, you know, you're used to the, the, the physical world and now you're moving to the digital. We hope this, this helps you move the ball down the road. Um, if you have any questions about what we presented today, or about corporate training and learning in general, we'd happily be a great resource for you. Um, you can email us. Please don't hesitate to email us. We have it right there. Um, you're welcome to call as well. Um, either way, we'd love to speak with you if you have any questions or if you find that, uh, you know, your project is too big to do by yourself and you're looking for some help, of course, we would love to work with you on that as well. Um, Anu, I want to thank you, um, not just for this webinar, but for, for your last one and, and all the help you've done over the past month or so um, and, and helping lead the charge on, on how we can move more to digital um, and, and providing some quick tips. Thanks, Anu, for doing that. I appreciate that. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, I think we had Thank over 500 much. people on this webinar, so uh, we, we touched a lot of people, and I'm happy to see that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining today. Uh, we really appreciate your presence here. All right. Well, thank you all again. We'll have access to this recording available within 48 hours. Uh, make sure you check your email. And I've also pasted that link in the side chat. Um, you can come back to that and the, the re recording will be in place of where it says register. Thank you all. Have a great day. Stay safe. Thank you.